I'm Regimental Sergeant Major Bill Wolf. I'm gonna crank the neck. Ah! Break it. For 30 years, I've taught soldiers how to stay alive in combat. Take a sports move, turn it into a deadly move. Got it? I know weapons. I know fear. Ah! And I know war. Take out his eye! Ah! How you train is how you react. But most of all, I know what it takes to become one of history's toughest soldiers. The U.S. has more soldiers at war right now than anyone else. You may think these are just kids who still believe in mum and apple pie, but trust me, you don't want to mess with G.I. Joe. They train at places like this, Fort William Henry Harrison in Helena, Montana. And it's where I've come to see if these GIs are as tough as they think they are. I want to know, can they fight? Can they shoot? Do they have what it takes to stay alive in combat? But most of all, I want to find out if they've got what I call assertive confidence. Because when they get to Iraq, they're going to need it. You guys are going to war. In this life and death struggle, what's the one rule? Survive. I will survive. I'll never give up. And you, no scumbag from any nation turns you into a victim, does he? And you have to find it within yourself to go that extra distance. Not only that, you got to do your job, period. That's what civilians don't understand. They get to go sit on the couch and have a cup of coffee after they put a couple nails in the front porch. Do you guys get that luxury? So the people at home watching you guys doing this, what they got to bloody well understand is that you got work to do. And it is work. So these guys train hard. But what else would you expect? Fort Harrison is the home of the legendary Devil's Brigade. The brigade was history's very first special forces unit, a mix of Canadians and Yanks who trained here in 42. They could jump, they could ski, they could fight like hell, but their trademark was unarmed combat. Their training was incredible by today's standards. It was realistic, it was tough, they're the only force in history that has never lost a foot of ground once they took it. So, I mean, these guys were good. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is still taught at Fort Harrison. But these days, recruits learn a mixed martial arts approach in keeping with softer rules of engagement. In my opinion, this is stupid because it teaches them to subdue, not kill. Go, 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 go! Keep going, keep going, keep going! When I went into combat, there was only one damn rule. You walk away, the other guy doesn't. So I'm gonna get these young lads fighting, old school, the devil's brigade here. Simple and bloody savage. You guys are going to war, and I don't want this young LT going over there and getting a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation and thinking he's got a sports fight, this motherfucker. He's gonna take him out and he's gonna kill him at the quick time. Everybody with me? All right, now let's start shortening it up. Less movements are better than more. It has to be efficient. Eyeballs disappear, balls disappear. Get in behind him and kill him. Clear the front angle because if he's got a knife, he's gonna gut you. The 163rd is a National Guard unit. They're citizen soldiers. Every one of them signed up looking for a fight. Come on, here's some knees on him. Step on his toes, balls and eyes. Let's go. But what they've been taught is how to hurt. What they must know is how to kill. Okay. All right, now guys, just come here a quick sec. Now what's happening, you guys are coming up like this, okay? And yeah, you're getting this nuts. The problem is, put a few pounds on this guy like a fat piece of shit. You're gonna get this foot and it's not gonna get there because you're gonna get stuck between his fat thighs. So you train yourself to make an ineffective kick. So I'm gonna tell you, this is a pretty hard trek to do because you're now off balance. So do something shorter, okay? Or work your distraction here. Now follow through. Now you guys gotta have a distraction because this is how old are you? 26. <laughs> Holy shit, my underwear are older than that. Okay, at 26, I can't outmuscle this kid. And none of you should think of that. If I'm doing this, we're sports. So what I'm doing is disrupt them, disrupt them, move to my point and get out of dodge. How you change, how you react. So do something more effective. Okay? Besides, this is a sissy kick anyway. 
These lads pick it up fast. What they needed to find was assertive confidence. If you could imagine, Joe's got a hold of my upper shoulder there and he's dragging me down like this. If I get to this position, what I'm looking at doing is this, breaking his leg. This hand's coming right into his balls right away. Now, where's Joe's mindset right now to kick me off and protect this little pack of whacker? Protect. All right, now from here, I'm getting up and I'm coming around and I'm taking his goddamn face off. All right, let's try it first clinically. You can try what you've to put in a suppressed position. Watch it. Grab his nuts, grab his nuts. If he doesn't grab his nuts, kick her in the face. Now, question for you guys. You got a hold of this package, et cetera, et cetera. What do you got to find? Right now, Joe's taking him down. What do you got to find? The next place to hit him. Oh, fucking stop fishing with hand grenades, for Christ's sake. What do you got to find? What do you got to find? Hands. Hands. What delivers weapons? Exactly. You're down there, and he's just taking. How you know he's not trying to slit your motherfucking throat? So find his damn hands. Because you may have to reprioritize to a knife fight, and God help it if it's a gun battle. So you're gonna have to be Johnny quicker, not Johnny later. Bill's training was interesting because it's very focused on the killing aspect and accomplishing the mission, and then the mind body about being able to drive on in adverse conditions. These guys are training hard in the physical, as you can see. The thing that's difficult for them to train for is the IED, the improvised explosive device. The psychological effect of that weapon is something they have to face every day. Iraqi insurgents use IEDs, improvised explosive devices, to fight from a distance. We've had IEDs explode out of newly paved roads because the, the Irhabiyun bribed the contractor to put a big artillery round right in the road as he was making it. So you never know when you're gonna get hit. When they go on patrol, the 163rd will wear the most protection any infantry soldier has ever had. Their helmets weigh three pounds and are made of a fabric-covered Kevlar. The Army says they can stop a bullet at 25 meters. Their body armor is an anti-shrapnel jacket with ceramic inserts. One in the front, a second in the back. They also have two underarm shields. Even the groin protector is bulletproof. Most of the time, the body armor works, but the enemy's counter strategy is simple and deadly. Hide a bomb and push a bloody button. There's a constant fear. You know, just every day you have no idea what's gonna happen and you might go a week and you're kind of letting your guard down and you're getting complacent and and uh, then all of a sudden something happens. And so just long periods of waiting marked by very sharp action. Every soldier today learns combat first aid and casualty evacuation is very quick and efficient. But there's another way to deal with the IEDs. Take out the bomb makers. When we come back, we'll see how G.I. Joe trains to do just that. Now, you guys probably don't feel too happy about using real blades. I can see it on your faces right now. You're going, holy fuck, this guy's weird. My first point of kill here is in, slice. My second is rotation. Now, brainstem down. You won't see this kind of training on the evening news. Civilians find it brutal. Army PR guys think it looks bad. But frontline soldiers find it indispensable. What I've done is I stuck my knife through his throat. You think I'm slicing it. I go through here. Then I take it out. In other words, I take his whole head off his shoulders. It's all just a tool in your toolbox. You may find yourself in a situation where that's all the only tool you have left. Knife fighting, it has its place. And uh, you get into a knife fight, you're going to get cut. Just cut the, cut the other guy worse. Cut him quicker, cut him worse. Good. In a time of laser-guided smart bombs, killing with a knife might seem old-fashioned. But when you're going house to house looking for bomb makers, most of the fighting is close in and dirty. Now in Iraq, this is urban warfare. 
Soldiers get isolated in these close combat situations sometimes. Knife fighting may seem like a redundant skill within the military arsenal, but some sort of edge weapon training that's effective and as a last resort must be taught. And these skills are being worked here today in a hard manner. These soldiers need to know this. This is the, one of the closest and safest ways of getting your mindset into facing a live blade. Everybody with me? If I come this way, you can hit with it. Have a good night, see that helps. Exactly, okay, everybody get the idea? Self-inflicted wound. That's what it's all about. You take a licking and keep on ticking. It's a, uh, a violent form of uh, self-defense. This is something that uh, we do need to incorporate within the Army because I think it'll improve the survivability if you do find yourself in an unarmed combat situation. You know, there can be times when your main weapon, your M4 malfunctions, transition to your M9, it malfunctions. What do you have left? You have a knife and then you have your hands. Now from here, kill. Shh. Back on. Okay, kill. Okay, now close. see how far away you are? Yep. You're gonna have to start closing that hole more. Kill. Shh. Okay. Units like the 163rd don't practice much with a knife. They need to do more. Most of their combat training is spent on the range. And if there's one thing G.I. Joe can do better than just about any soldier, it's shoot a gun. Americans love their guns. And G.I. Joe can handle himself in a firefight. Firefights happen suddenly. A knife is good when it's up close. But a G.I.'s best friend is his assault rifle. Fire. And his weapon is not just any gun. It's the Colt M4, the grown-up version of one of the most famous weapons in history, Vietnam's M16. The M4 weighs only seven pounds, and even with a fully loaded 30-round mag, it's light and deadly. With an effective range of 200 meters, the M4 is designed for urban fighting. Add on a night vision scope and a grenade launcher, and G.I. Joe's weapon is one nasty piece of business. But even the best weapon is no good if you can't use it. So before they go to war, the G.I.s rehearse the many scenarios they might face in combat. All right, this is the scenario, okay? You're in a vehicle, it's got some protection in it, but it's broken down. Today, their vehicle's been hit by an RPG. They're pinned down, and they're under fire. All right, you're not firing, you're just rehearsing it, okay. and uh, get a little muscle memory, and then we'll do, all right, go. Hell. Tell me where I moved! Move it! In position! And when you're ambushed in Fallujah, being perfect keeps you from having your ass shot off. Got you covered! Move then, move! Moving like frozen pond water. When he comes in here, he's right. looking for targets of opportunities, coming out bang, bang, okay. right? Bang, bang. When, when you're ready to move and he's laying down, now he's laying down suppressive fire so you can move, you're keeping their head right. down. You hear him go from just a single shot targets of opportunity to okay. laying down suppressive right. fire. That's what that's your cue to move. I mean, you okay. should Roger that. you hear that I, I, he's laying down suppressive fire. The enemy's probably backing up, keeping their heads down. That's okay. when you move. Yeah, that's you the gotta, whole purpose. I think you got to watch Tuesday. You're standing right here. What you know, I mean, you must just frame yourself because your, your muzzle's right. almost out the door. So you're gonna have to get yeah. a little more oblique to something. Otherwise, I couldn't Back think of a better way uh, to shoot your ass off. This is called the what? Fatal funnel. There you exactly. go. The fatal funnel. Go ahead and hit it. Come on, man. I like the violent execution. There was no dilly dallying around. They got right to the points of domination and they flooded down, they flooded the range, the targets with a high volume of fire. There's speed, surprise, and violence of action. That was violence of action. They got a, you know, a lot of shots in the kill zone. You know, a lot of insurgents, they're, they're not wearing body armors like we are. So, you know, you, the, the, the thing is with the 5.56 five, round is that uh, they're finding you have to put, you know, when I was trained, it was always two and two. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing now is you gotta, you gotta go for four and two. That's you know, why. you gotta put four or five in their body to put them down, 
and then two in the head to finish them off. This is the round G.I. Joe uses to take insurgents down, the 5-5-6. Five, five, the enemy uses the round on the left, a 7.62, which has filled the mags of the most famous assault weapon in history. When GIs go into battle, the weapon they're gonna face most often is this one, the AK-47. About 100 million AKs have been used in battle. It's the weapon of choice for insurgents because it's reliable and it's cheap. In Iraq, every family is legally allowed one per household. And the guys who own them probably think they're hot shots. But guess what? G.I. Joe is not too bad either. This is the final weapon in every American soldier's arsenal. All right, bend your legs a little. The Come M9 the pistol. Right. Deadly within 50 meters if you know how to use it. And most soldiers do. You got 45 seconds to complete this. Go! Hurry up, hurry up. Nice. Scan, scan, scan. 35 seconds. The M9 pistol, the M4 rifle, and the personal killing knife. Throw on some body armor, and the American soldier is a tough opponent. But the average American trooper is not just a tough soldier, he's a smart soldier too. When we come back, we'll see how training and teamwork keeps G.I. Joe alive in combat. The goal of any infantry unit is to close with and destroy the enemy. The US troops in Iraq may seem to have the cards stacked against them, but they have one huge advantage. They are the best trained troops on that battlefield. And they get that training in places like this, Baghdad, USA, an Iraqi village built by the National Guard, hidden away in a Mississippi swamp. It's where units like the 163rd come to practice real-world scenarios before leaving for war. On this day, the GIs are looking for insurgents hidden somewhere in town. The Army calls this type of mission cordon and search. Here's how it works. The first phase we broke down into our outer cordon, which is set out uh, as far as ways you can get, but you can seal off the areas where no vehicle traffic can come in or out. Hey, turn off the vehicle. Phase two, search every house. Let's go knock on the door. And just like the real world, the locals get pissed off. Let them know what we're doing. Let them know what we're doing. But with a bit of smooth talking, Things calm down. Tell him, tell him that it's not per, it's not, tell him it's just something that we have to do. We're not, he has in no way done anything wrong. It's for our safety as well as his. And the locals give the bad guys up. Real world missions happen just like this. Without local intel, you're guessing. Without that working relationship, uh, they could steer you into a bad situation. If he's an insurgent sympathizer, you could have possible IEDs inside the building. You could have suicide bombers inside the building, uh, booby traps. This kind of training teaches GIs how to balance power with politics. Knowing the difference saves lives. And hopefully there's a level of trust based off of uh, mutual respect. Um, since we're helping them, they're going to help us a little bit. September 2004. Hawija, Iraq. On the eve of elections, local intel revealed Al-Qaeda had set up an IED factory in Hawija. Sergeant James Zimmerman led a platoon into the city that day. 
we had intelligence that the enemy was building up in order to hit us with IEDs and direct weapons attacks. And so it was our big concern was to uh, clear the city of any possible caches of weapons, IED manufacturing plants, uh, or catch any foreign insurgents that were hiding out. Deep in what's called the Sunni Triangle, Hawija is not exactly George Bush country. Locals say this place was the original Garden of Eden. The GIs call it the dead zone. Get in there, let's go. Get in the house. 0700, the 163rd enters Hawija and comes under sniper fire. But the body armor works, big time. It's expensive, but it definitely saves lives. Um, it's absolutely lowered the number of people that would have died from their wounds. I mean, it absolutely works. Zimmy ran a well-trained platoon, and his guys knew what to do. Watch the windows, figure out the arcs of fire, let the M4 do its job. Under 100 meters, typically, where you're firing there, it's an outstanding weapon. And, of course, now we can attach all sorts of infrared laser sighting devices, uh, reflexive sights, ACOGs, and that really makes that weapon uh, outstanding to use. Moving quickly through the industrial part of the city, the 163rd came visiting, Montana style. Every house became a potential kill zone as the GIs found themselves engaged in CQB. Close quarter combat. Those situations do happen. I mean, you're in close quarters and Iraqi homes are small. The rooms are small, the hallways are tight. Um, and most of the houses aren't an open floor plan. They contain a lot of small rooms and niches. and So it's very difficult fighting, especially when you're carrying 80 pounds of body armor. The battle for Huija lasted six hours. Lacking the firepower or the one-on-one -on -one fighting skills, the insurgents surrendered. Two days later, the elections were held in peace. In Huija, the 163rd did it right. They fought hard and they fought smart. But the lads from Montana also brought one other thing to the battle that day, assertive confidence. And when G.I. Joe has that, he's hard to beat. We'll see you next time on History's Toughest Soldiers.